Okay, good morning. Once again, I want to thank you for tuning in to BBS TV to study biology with me. Uh, my name is Jovia Katuhaise. As usual, I am going to teach you biology. And as I promised last time, the next topic is going to be coordination. This is a topic that the majority of you chose. So I didn't dictate on this topic. So we are going to start with this topic. And then the other topics that came in later on, I, I had a variety of topics. But the second most common topic was uh, locomotion. And then we also had genetics. And then we also had... Um, is it cell division? Something. Most of them were senior four topics. And so we are going to start with coordination in animals. <coughs> coordination is divided into parts. We have coordination in animals and in plants. As per now, we shall start with animals and then we shall end with coordination in plants. It's after coordination that we shall choose the next topic to go with. That's if God allows and we have, ta and we have life. <coughs> Um, today's lesson, the major expectations of the lessons, as, uh, of today's lesson as we are introducing it, we shall look at the major definitions on coordination. Since we are just introducing it, we are going to do only the introductory bit of it. So we are going to look at the major definitions. What are different definitions that you're going, the key words that you're going to be meeting all along within the session of coordination. I'll introduce them today. And then uh, later on, we shall look at the mammalian endocrine system, which is basically the hormonal system. Then we shall look at what a hormone is, the characteristics of the hormones and their functions. And then we shall look at a gland, the different types of glands there are. And the reference questions for today, uh, the reference question is UNEB, 1996, question 32, paper 1. However, we shall have some uh, other reference questions alongside my um, the lesson. But that is the major reference question for today. And I won't change it. Even the next time when we are studying this, it will, be, it will still be the reference question because it's, it, it's, it's covering a bigger part of the, of the endocrine system. So... As usual, I used uh, Jeff Howard 2000 edition, Macmillan Secondary Biology, the international edition. As I always say, you can use any other kind of a textbook other than that, though this is always my choice. Uh, to get back to the lessons of uh, to today's lesson of coordination, coordination in science, but in English, coordination coming from the word coordinate. Oftentimes we've been at school and you've been told to coordinate different people. Can you coordinate your members? Can you coordinate the French students? Can you coordinate the, the, the B class, the biological class? Can you coordinate with these people? And it's a word that you often use in English. And then here it comes also in science is there. And then we're asking ourselves, what is coordination all about? In English, to coordinate means to connect or to interlink or to bring different people together to achieve a common goal or a common task. That is coordination in English. But then what about in science? In science, coordination still remains as in English, but then we look at it in the concept of your body. In the concept of a body of an organism, in the concept of a plant body, in the concept of your body, here we look at the different body parts, the parts of your body, that is from your head up to your toe, how the different body parts interlink together or come together to achieve a general function or connection between the different parts of your body, how they connect in order to bring about a general um, at a general function of your body or working, the working system of your body. And that is what different uh, coordination means in, in a general way, not in a specific way, the way we define it in science. Remember I told you that in science, you just have to understand the concept. You don't need to cram the exact definition that your teacher gave you in your book. At the end of the day, cramming in science will not work. When you forget one word, you forget the entire definition. So better understand and write what you understand by coordination. And then the, way, the best way of passing science is you read a question, translate it in English. 
coordination. And to you in English, what is coordination? Co to coordinate, networking, linking up together. So you look at how the different parts of our body or the different systems of our body come together or work together to achieve a general task. And that is simply coordination in the layman's language. But then in the scientific way, how do we define coordination? We look at the uh, coordination as a, a process by which different body parts or different body systems or different body organs work together to achieve a general function. And the working is always in a proper manner. So they work together in a proper or an appropriate manner in order to bring about an appropriate response or reaction. So the series of changes that take place in your body, where the different body parts, the head, the toe, the knee, how those different body parts come together and in an appropriate way react to respond to a particular change in the environment is what we look at as coordination. Take for instance, imagine you're walking and you realize that you're about to step on a snake as you're seeing on your screen. You're walking in green grass and as you're walking, you are even seeing it or maybe you're, you, you're from fetching water or you're having a pot or whatever jerry can on your head. You're from a river or whatever, uh, whatever. You're from doing something or collecting firewood or you're in the forest doing some work or you're in the garden doing some gardening. And then all of a sudden, you realize you're about to step on a snake. And when you look down, you look at it when its mouth is widely as wide as open as you're seeing it on your screen. What happens to your body? Do you continue to step on it? Or do you just stand and, and smile at it? Or imagine where you're seated right now in your sitting room or wherever you're seated, whether your bedroom, your sitting room, or on, on the dining, under, under the table where you're seated. As you, you look down, that snake is there the way it is on the screen. And it is, its, its, its mouth is wide open. Do you remain seated there? To some of us, even a small fly, the moment a fly passes by, you run away, a cockroach. The series of events or reactions that take place in your body, when you see a change in an environment and you respond to it in a particular way, is what we call coordination. When you're about to step on a snake, you look at it, you shout, then you scatter, you run away. The Different events that have taken place in your body. It's like your eye has seen a snake. And then your brain is involved that this, it, it interprets, integrates, processes that this is a very dangerous organ, organism. And then all of a sudden your muscles are given enough energy. They contract. And when they contract, they give you energy to run away. So you are seeing that you're having the eye seeing the snake. You're having the brain process that this is a very dangerous organ, organism. And then in your brain you're like, it will burn me and then your muscles are involved and then they contract and then your legs are taking off and then later on to some of us you, you even get developed goose pimples all over your body there's a lot of reactions that are taking place in your body in order for you to respond to a snake a mere snake some of them are even harmless they are not poisonous so to respond to a mere snake, the, a group of those reactions whereby the different body parts, your eye, your brain, your legs, your muscles come together in order for you to respond to a change in an external environment is what you call coordination. Whereby the body parts react in an appropriate manner or in a proper manner. None exceeds the other. Because if one exceeds the other, then you may not carry out a, cr a correct response to a particular stimulus. So that series of changes in your body to respond to a change in the external environment is what we call coordination. Once again, in scientific way, the definition of coordination is the working together of the different body parts or body systems or body organs in a proper manner to bring about an appropriate response or reaction to a change to a change in an environment. The environment could be inside your body or it could be outside your body. 
so in the external the the, the, the the no more external atmosphere so those changes and our response to them is what we call coordination and coordination is is typical to all living organisms it's in in, in senior one we looked at the characteristics of living organisms and one of them was they respond to changes to the external environment or irritability so so long as you are living, you ought to respond to change to the external environment. You ought to coordinate, to carry out coordination, because coordination at the end of the day is protective. It is protective in most cases when we are carrying out change response to the external environment, we are either running away from danger, and in the end, in the, in the end, we are protecting our lives. Imagine you're walking in the forest or within the grass, and you step on a thorn. You immediately uh, a knee jerk will happen. You bend your knee, remove your leg, and then you start getting your, the thorn away from, trying to check what has pierced me. Imagine you're going to sit on a stool, and you sit on a needle, and it pierces. You continue putting your buttocks on the needle. What are the reactions that come about? You're cooking in the kitchen, and then you are, you, you are all by accident, all of a sudden you touch, uh, I mean, you touch a hot object. So like some of us, we even, uh, some of us know, uh, we even say that we are women, so we don't, we, women are meant to be burnt. And so it's a, the saucepan is very hot, it's, it's containing a lot of boiling sauce or whatever food, and then you go with your bare hands and you touch the saucepan. It's very hot, it's going to burn you. So when you touch a hot object, what responses come about? We know we even tell our own siblings, the young ones or our young children, you know what? Expose him or her to a hot object and then he starts saying, Chocha, it's hot, eh? It's hot. And then you'll just let him first touch it. It burns them. Then they remove their hand very fast and they will never do it again. The series of responses that are taking place in your body when you're exposed to a change in the external environment is what we, we are calling coordination. You just don't remain the same. Oftentimes you can sleep when there is music, you know, in the background. You sleep when it is so sweet, the music is playing, maybe it's slow, slow jams or whatever. That, they call it music. So you sleep in uh, amid this music. But once you hear a gun, a gunshot, you can wake up or a bomb blast. You wake up very fast or something, a sudden weird, weird noise. But amid this music you were sleeping. But when there's that, that weird noise or maybe of a bomb blast or maybe there's, there's, there, there some, there's some shootings and in the neighborhood, immediately you wake up. And then you are racing all of a sudden because it's something that is not, it's not common. It's, 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 it exceeds the normal, the norm that you slept under. And those responses, whereby you can even separate particular changes from others in the external environment, is what we are going to learn about. Each of the things I've mentioned about, we are going to learn about them in a particular unique way. Trust me, this is the most interesting topic that you can ever have. Most students take it to be the most difficult one, but I want to tell you it's the most interesting topic. And so I implore you to, get, uh, to stay tuned on. So before I continue with coordination, we've got to look at the major terms. What are the key terms that we look at when we are studying coordination? The first term is... A stimulus. I will use this word more often in this topic, and I want you to first get to know what it is. What is a stimulus? A stimulus simply meaning a change in the, in the external environment to which you will respond. That is a stimulus. Take for instance, when you are, you are walking and it starts raining, all of a sudden you run away from rain, you go and and, and, and get a shaded place where there's no rain, or you get your raincoat on, or you get a jacket. So you are responding. The stimulus there is the rain, and the response is you going near a place uh, in a house or in a place that is shaded to run away from rain or to get a coat. 
When it's cold, you get a jacket. So the coldness is the stimulus and the getting of the jacket is the response. Or say when it's very hot, you go under shed. And then the hotness in the, is the change in the environment. It's the stimulus. And you getting, going to a shaded place, it's a response. Say you are hungry, you look for food. So the hunger is the stimulus. And the looking for food or eating of food is the response. And say maybe um, you're about to step on a snake. And then all of a sudden you jump. You run away. The snake is the stimulus. The jumping and running away is the response. So that is what you call a stimulus. The change in the external environment. It could be external or internal because hunger is internal. Uh, you can feel thirsty and you feel like taking water and then you take water. Then the, the, that um, feeling, uh, the feeling of being thirsty now is our stimulus and taking water is the response. So Stimulus is just any change in the external environment that stimulates you to respond to it in, a pro in an appropriate manner. So that is a stimulus. The next uh, major term is what you call a response. Remember when I was talking about a stimulus, I was telling you this is a stimulus, then this is a response. So a response simply means your reaction towards a stimulus like i mean you are going to see you are walking and you see a snake and its mouth is wide open instead of you just stepping on it you jump away and run so the running jumping away from the snake running is from the snake running and then all the 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 alarms that you make that is the response you know, and then you realize you, are, you touch a hot object and immediately you remove your hand from a hot object. So remove of a hand from a hot object is a response and the hot object is the stimulus. The next one is, say, um, as I said earlier on, it's raining, you run away from rain, you go and... You, 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 you go to a shaded area or you, it's so cold, you get a coat, you, got a, you get a jacket. So the, getting a jacket is the response and the coldness is the stimulus. So responses simply is how you react to the change to the external environment, your reaction. And it's always appropriate to that particular stimulus. These two terms are summed up by a major term we call irritability. Irritability, remember in senior one, when we were looking at characteristics of living things? And he said, one of them is irritability. If you still remember, I always give it an acronym of Mrs. Grain. Mrs. Grain is a characteristic, it's a group of characteristics of living things that they move, they respond to, um, they reproduce, there's sensitivity, which is the same as irritability, then there's growth, then there is respiration, and then there is nutrition. We feed. So for you to qualify to be a living thing, you must be sensitive to changes to the external environment, or you must carry out what you call irritability. Now, irritability combines a stimulus and a response. Simply in the layman's language, irritability it means response to changes in the external environment or response to a, sti uh, a stimulus. As I said, if you touch a hot object and you remove your hand, that is irritability. So there is the stimulus and the response to that stimulus. The way you respond, you know, the, the particular ways we can respond to different stimulus. The, we can carry out irritability. The way you respond to a tickle is not the same way you respond to a slap, you know. So the response is that someone can slap you so hard and when that person slaps you so hard, you don't need to laugh. I mean, the different, you, you, you get, you respond to a particular stimulus or change the external environment or to your internal environment. And their slaps, the slaps are different. There's that hard slap as a punishment and there's, there's this soft and loving slap whereby someone just slaps on your chin and the way the response is totally different and that is how you 
differentiate what you call irritability. So if someone just rubs on your body or your chin and then you come out and you're all gloomy and you're all angry, then you have a, a, a problem when it comes to irritability. So that is irritability. It combines a stimulus and a response. Um, um, then the other term is that we are going to look at basically the receptor. A receptor. A receptor simply means a group of specialized cells that respond, uh, that take up your stimulus and convert it into another, an electrical signal we call an, an impulse. So uh, in, in the layman's language, I want to take it to, to the layman's language, a, a receptors are a group of specialized cells that detect the stimulus that detect the change in the external environment. However, in the scientific way, we can say a group of specialized cells that convert a stimulus to an electrical signal, to an all to an impulse. But in Alleyman's language, you can also define them as the first cells to detect the change in the external environment. An example is your skin. You know, it can detect coldness. So we have different kinds of receptors that res uh, detect different changes in the stimulus. We have what you call the thermoreceptors. These ones, these are cells that now detect heat or changes in heat to extend environment. So we have uh, several thermoreceptors in the body. Even our skin is a, a, a thermoreceptor. It can respond to heat. I mean, when a hot object, when you touch a hot object, it's the skin that first experiences the hotness. And that is when all the other reactions come in. When it experiences the hotness from maybe a cup of tea, or some of us when we are eating, we know mululu. You eat, the food is so hot, and then you put it all in your mouth, and then you start like you, you eat when your mouth is wet, taking some air to, to cool the food. And that, the, 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 that feeling of feeling that this food is so hot, the group of cells that sense that it's so hot, they are called thermoreceptors. And then you also have what you call pain receptors. These ones are uh, uh, sense pain. Anything that is so pain into your body. You're feeling a stomach ache. Your head is aching. Or say something they are, they, they are injecting you. You are taking up an injection and it's so paining. Anything that is so paining, is exp it's always sensed by the pain receptors, which are located also in your body. The next kind group of receptors are the chemoreceptors. These ones are sensitive to chemicals in your body or chemicals in the external environment. You've had some people who are allergic, just smelling something, oh God, or just any, being around any, uh, any environment that is having any chemical, they develop rashes or whatever, they get nauseated, and that is changes. The, 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 the cells that detect the chemicals are what you call the chemo receptors. And then we have what you call the mechanoreceptors. These are specialized cells that sense changes in pressure. Pressure in your body or in the external environment. And then there are mechanoreceptors. Lastly, we have what you call photoreceptors. A photo coming from the word light or sunlight. So the ability for you to, 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 to respond to changes in the light intensity, in the external environment, is that is done by a group of receptors in your body we call the photoreceptors. And basically here your eyes cannot be excluded. And some of these receptors have come together and formed what you call organs, an entire organ. And these organs are what you call the sense organs. We have a group of very many sense organs. For those in primary, 
who are even watching, you've studied these sense organs in primary. So the different sense organs we have, the eyes, which are, are, which, are resp uh, which have the photoreceptors, they're in charge of sensing, seeing in light. We basically see very well when there is sunlight. And when it's in the dark, in most cases, we see something, an object in its black and white color or in grays. But then in bright light, you can easily see the shape the color, and you see an object at detail. So that is the eye, it's a sense organ. Then we have, uh, this one is responsible for sight. Then we have the nose, uh, let's call it the nostril, which is responsible for smell. You know, sometimes someone moves by a dustbin and it's so stinky. Not even a dustbin, a rubbish pit. Or maybe someone farts in class or gassing. And it's so, so, the, the, and the smell is so pathetic. Then you touch your nose or your nostril. You don't want to smell it. So this is the organ. Then we have the, the tongue. which is in charge of testing because it has test bugs. The ear, and this one we know, it's very important in the process of hearing or detecting sound waves. So these are receptors, a group of cells. They are the first to detect a change in the external environment or a stimulus. Take for instance, oftentimes we could be reading and you are seated somewhere, in, in, you sit and read in the library, and then one student comes in with some funny noise of their shoes. There's a way you, you the moment you hear it, that is your ears, we start hearing the funny noise, and then you, it will coordinate to your brain. It will, uh, it will detect that stimulus first, and then it will send it, convert it into another form of an electrical signal which will be taken to your brain. And your brain will be like, that must be a girl. She's wearing high heels. And then the brain is going to send a signal to your eyes. And then you're going to look at the girl by your eyes. And then some of us will be reading, you look at the girl and all the girl is dressed, maybe she's half naked. And then you even forget your reading and then you start undressing the girl from the, the, the blouse up to the, the, the underwears where you're seated. The series of events that are taking place in your brain from hearing that funny noise of the kakondo up to you looking at the girl and undressing her. All those events are taking place within your body. The girl is unaware and the people seated around you are unaware. So that series of events is what we are, we are here to look at in terms of coordination. So um, then the other major term are the effectors. You cannot talk about a receptor and you don't talk about a re an effector. Just like its name effector, it effects change. You know, after uh, uh, you've received information, after the receptor has received information, it goes to your brain. You process, integrate it, and then you get a feedback. So that feedback is affected by the effector cells, which are a group of specialized cells that carry out a response to the stimulus. Remember, the receptors receive the stimulus. The effectors effect a response to that particular stimulus. So if, if, if you're walking and you, you suddenly step on a nail or on a thorn, the process of you removing your, head, your leg from it, there's a group of muscles that line that part where the thorn uh, has pierced, they will contract in order for you to get the energy of removing your head, oh, sorry, of your, your removing your leg from a thorn. And that response is done by the effector cells. Lastly, an impulse. 
Now this is coming last and these words I'll speak about them more often. An impulse simply meaning after you are seeing the change in the external environment, the stimulus, right? The receptor identifying it. The receptor will convert it into another form we call an electrical signal. That electrical signal is transmitted from your receptor across specialized cells we call nerve cells or neurons to the brain as in form of an electrical information. And the brain interprets it and then sends feedback back to the muscles, the effectors, where you make a response. So that transmission, that electrical impulse, sorry, signal that is transmitted to your brain to bring about a response is what you call a stimulus, sorry, an impulse. So an impulse is simply an electrical signal which is transmitted across nerve cells to your central nervous system to bring about an effective response. It's like it's like, it's like a message. I type a message on my phone, like WhatsApp, and then I click send. It's sent in an electrical way, and the person within the shortest time receives it and can give me the feedback. So it's analogous to that. That is what you call an impulse. So I'd like the, pro uh, the producer to relay to us the, the, the series of changes that take place in our body when we get to a stimulus to bring about a response. That picture should be uh, relayed on the screen. Know the first picture, that one. So this is what happens when we are to carry out um, a stimulus response way. We start with the stimulus, as you're seeing. The stimulus sees a glass containing, say, juice, <laughs> though it's blue in color. So it's containing a liquid that is blue. And the eye is the receptor. It sees the glass. And then after seeing the glass, it's the receptor inside is going to convert the stimulus, the glass of juice, into a, an electrical information we call an impulse that will be transmitted across the sensory neuron, as you're seeing, to the brain, which, is, which makes a central nervous system. The brain will interpret the electrical signal that that must be a glass. It's the brain that is responsible for saying, of telling, of, of interpreting the signal that has been brought, that that is a glass. It contains juice. And then after it has interpreted, integrated, and processed that, it would also determine the feedback that, you know what, better get that glass and you take that juice. So after the brain has interpreted and processed that and given you the feedback, the feedback again is converted into an electrical signal and sent via your motor neuron towards the effectors. And this time the effectors is your hand. And the effectors in your hand are the muscles that are going to contract. And when they contract, you will get the energy to lift your hand and pick the glass containing the juice and in order for you to take. So that is the series of reactions that take place in your body. You can see there are different body parts that are connected. We have the eye, we have the neurons, we have the brain, you're having the hand and the muscles. So different body parts are being coordinated or are being brought together to react to a particular uh, stimulus or change in the external environment. And that is what you call coordination. So, the last bit of this, um, coordination in animals is divided into two. We have, we have um, the nervous system. And then we have what you call the endocrine system. The nervous system simply, it's the electrical way. It, it just simply involves the neurons, the brain, and the spinal cord. So, and then the endocrine system, basically we look at the hormones, hormonal control. What is an endocrine system? For today we are going to start with the endocrine system, and then after we shall go to the nervous system.
an endocrine system, a system made up of a group of organs that secrete chemicals or secrete chemical substances to the different body, uh, to the different parts of our body, that where the chemical substances will exert an effect. So the different organs that secrete the chemical substances that exert effects in our body, we are uh, the different organs are what you call the glands. And then the chemical substances that are secreted by the glands that will exert effect in our body are what you call the hormones. And thus, in most cases, you find people saying the endocrine system is the hormonal system. We look at how hormones regulate body responses or changes in our body and the changes in the external environment. And these hormones are always secreted by the glands. But what's a hormone? A hormone is like a messenger, a chemical messenger that tells your a particular part of your body, a group, or a group of tissues of your body, either to do something or to stop doing something. So in the layman's language, that's a hormone. But scientifically, a hormone is a chemical substance or a chemical messenger produced in minute quantities or small quantities by an endocrine gland or by a gland from one part of the body to the other part of the body via the circulatory system where it exerts its effect. It's kind of a long definition, but you, you ought to know how a hormone works. It is a chemical substance produced by an endocrine gland from one part of the body and is taken to the other part of the body via your bloodstream to where it exerts its effect. And therefore, when it's taken to another part of your body, it either instructs that part of the body to do something or it stops that uh, it also instructs that part of the body to stop doing something so it's like the stop or do something kind of chemical messengers in our body but remember we've said they are produced by glands and particular here i want us to look at what are glands and how do these glands look like so we have two basic types of glands we have what you call the endocrine glands, and then we have what you call the exocrine glands. But before we continue to identifying them as two different types, what's a gland? Remember we said a hormone is secreted from a gland. So when it comes to a gland, it's just an organ or a structure that secretes useful chemical substances. In our body and these chemical substances that the gland secrete could either be hormones or they could be other secretions like tears say mucus say other secretions in a body say digestive juices so that is a gland a, an organ in a body that secretes useful chemical substances in a body and amongst them we have the hormones so as today we are going to look at a gland in the sense of it secreting a hormone and the glands that secrete hormones majorly are the endocrine glands remember i've said there are two of two types endocrine gland and the exocrine gland and then i want to see how does the endocrine gland how is the endocrine gland different from the exocrine glands we start with the exocrine glands these are glands in our body that have what you call tubes we call ducts so it's an organ say like this and then in the body it has a tube we call a duct a duct is like a tube across which its chemical secretion are carried from the gland to the point of action. So this gland here secretes the hormone from it, and the hormones pass through this duct or tube to the bloodstream where the hormone is carried by the blood to the 
target site or to the part of the body where the hormone is going to bring about an action. And so because they have ducts, we call them exo, exocrine, um, exocrine glands. There are very many examples of exocrine glands that we have in a body that have ducts. Among us, them we have the salivary glands. If you still remember, we have what you call a salivary duct. So the salivary gland that secretes saliva is uh, an, 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 an exocrine gland. Then we have the mammary gland that secretes milk. It's also an exocrine gland. We have the sweat glands. You remember we have the sweat ducts. So production of sweat. These are some of them are not hormones. So sweat glands are also examples of our exocrine glands. We have the pancreas. The pancreas has the pancreatic duct via which the di digestive juices are secreted. So in that instance, the pancreas becomes the exocrine gland. We have the tear glands that produce tears, so the tear duct. Via the tear duct and therefore the tear gland becomes an exocrine gland. So any gland that has a duct or a tube across which its secretion pass to the bloodstream where they are taken to their target site, that kind of a gland is called an exocrine gland. The next type of a gland is the endocrine gland. Just like this exocrine is having ducts, endocrine adductylase. These glands here, or organs here, for them they do not have tubes across which their secretions are passed. So in, 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 in response, when they are secreting their chemicals or chemical substances, they secrete them directly into the bloodstream. So they, are, they do not pass via any kind of a tube. So their contents are discharged directly into the bloodstream from where they are transported by the blood to the target sites. And an example of such endocrine glands, again, you're having the pancreas. So now you're here, the pancreas is both under the exocrine gland, it's also under the endocrine gland. In the exocrine gland, it's when it is secreting the pancreatic juice by, via the pancreatic duct. So because there it has a duct, the pancreas acts as an exocrine gland. But then in the endocrine sense, it has no ducts. It's when it's secreting the two groups of hormones we all know about. I don't know whether we all know about, but they are most common. One is insulin hormone. Another one is the glucagon hormone. Those two hormones are involved in blood sugar, uh, blood sugar regulations for the people who have issues with diabetes or sugar levels. And so the pancreas uh, secretes those two hormones, glucagon and insulin. But rather, those two hormones are not secreted via a tube. They are discharged directly into the blood where the blood transports them to their target sites. So in that sense, the pancreas acts as an endocrine gland. The other examples of endocrine glands we have are the adrenal glands that secrete adrenaline hormone. We have the thyroid glands that uh, secrete the thyroid hormone, the, the thyroxine hormone, and whatever. So the thyroid gland, adrenal glands, all of them are ductless, and so they discharge their contents directly into the blood stream. And those are the two basic groups of glands that we have. I'm requesting the producer to display the picture of glands, major endocrine glands on your screens. We look at them. That is the picture of the major endocrine glands. And now here you are looking at this human being in two, two. We have the male side and the female side. You can differentiate them, please. Because if you look at this person, it's not entirely female because there's no female who has the testis. Unless you have challenges. Or there's no male with the ovaries. Unless you also have challenges and you're hemo a hermaphrodite. So these are the major glands. Many more have been skipped, but we shall look at them in details. Each of these, we are going to look at it in details. The hormone it secretes, the functions of those hormones in the body, what are the effects when the hormones are over-secreted or they are under-secreted. But for you to just look at them, in the head region, the brain region, we have what we call the master gland, the pituitary gland, which is a bean-shaped kind of a gland located at the base of your brain. It's a muscle gland because it controls the activities of all these other glands down. Then we have the pineal gland. 
the thyroid gland thyroid gland is an, an endocrine gland it's it's ductless and it produces the thyroid hormone the an, an adrenal gland in the kidney area near your kidneys it's also an um an endocrine gland it lacks the ducts and then we have the pancreas in between your kidneys as you can see it's both endocrine and exocrine then we have the ovaries that secrete estrogen hormone in females responsible for the secondary sexual characteristics in us the women and it's an endocrine gland the testis in male it's also a gland it secretes a hormone we call testi uh, testosterone which is responsible for the secondary sexual characteristics of males. And in that case, it's an endocrine gland. So these basically are endocrine glands. But remember, they basically secrete hormones. But then we also had the exocrine glands, which have ducts, and they're not being represented here. So that is about the gland about the hormones and now the last bit of our lesson today was about the characteristics of hormones and their functions what are the characteristics of hormones a hormone in your body in most cases we had enzymes we looked at enzymes in details under digestion under nutrition but in most cases the characteristics of enzymes often be the same as the characteristics of hormones so what are the extics of hormones i hope you people in your exams you don't write this x let me even change it Hormones in our body, we've already said the first characteristic is they are secreted by the endocrine glands. So that is the first characteristic, secreted from endocrine gland. The next thing in the definition of a hormone, I said they are always produced. They are produced and also work better in minute quantities of hormone. You do not have to produce a full jerry can of hormones, of the estrogen hormone for you to have secondary sexual characteristics or else you're going to overgrow particular parts of your body. And so they always, they always secreted in small quantities and they work best in those small quantities the next characteristic is they are protein in nature hormones are proteins so the proteins we eat in a diet some of them are used to form hormones and so you take you undertake proteins you under uh, develop your hormones and you will not grow very well so they are protein in nature and then the other characteristic is the action is often away from their uh, production site so where they are produced is not where they exert the actions the actions is always to the target sites so they are produced from one site and they're transported to the other site where they exert their effect so the action is uh, produced away from the target site. And then the other thing is the aura is transported from the site of production to the target site by the bloodstream or by the circulatory system. And so they do not just flow alone. They are always discharged in blood and that is where they are transported from one site to another majority of our hormones are water soluble and so they can easily dissolve in blood majorly they are soluble in blood and then the other thing is their actions are specific this is common to enzymes the enzymes are also specific in nature but we also know that proteins are specific in nature and they are highly affected by temperature and ph changes but that is not under hormones Hormones are highly specific. Why? The hormone response for, for the secondary sexual characteristics in females is different from that in males. And then when you give me the hormone for the males, then it, 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 it does not mean that I would totally develop the male secondary sexual characteristics. So their actions are highly specific. The target sites are highly specific. So when you interchange the hormones, one hormone cannot affect the activities of 
the other. So they're highly specific in nature. They are not stored for a long period of time in a body and therefore they're easily destroyed. After their actions, they are destroyed and the body will synthesize other hormones from majorly the proteins that we take within our diet. Um, then the other, uh, the last characteristic is their effect on target organs is either to stimulate or to stop. As I said, the hormone is, a hormone is like a messenger. A messenger comes to your office to tell you either go or don't. So that is what the hormone does. It will be secreted to your body to, from, from its gland to the target site. When it comes to the target site, it will either stimulate action of an action in that target uh, target site or it will inhibit an action in that target site so they are in that they work in that manner so those are hormones and their major characteristics and maybe to leave a simple task for you based on what we have studied how do you think hormones are different from enzymes what if you ask to compare and contrast a hormone and an enzyme, how would you compare and contrast the two? How are they different? How are they similar? That is your question. The next question I can leave for you is, what are the functions of hormones in the body? In the next lesson, when I come back, we are going to look at the different glands that we have looked at, starting from the pituitary gland and the hormones they secrete at length. We shall start with the pituitary gland, the master gland, the hormones it secretes, the different other glands, the hormones, the functions of each of the hormones, what happens to your body when you over-secrete a particular hormone and you under-secrete another one, what happens to your body if you don't secrete a particular hormone, and that is what you're going to look at in the next lesson. We are basically going to look at glands and the hormones they secrete, basically the endocrine system. As per today, we have looked at coordination and introduced coordination in animals. And we've said it's a process by which the major parts of our body come together or network to produce a major activity. And we've looked at the major definitions such as the stimulus, the receptor, the effectors, the response, the impulse, and whatever. We've also introduced the endocrine system. And we've looked at basically the glands and the hormones, the characteristics of hormones and the different types of hormones. So the next time I come, as I said, we are going to look at different glands and the hormones they produce at length. The reference question for today on your screen is, Yuneb, question number 32, 1996, paper one. The next question I have left is, compare a hormone and an enzyme and also write for me the different functions of hormones that you think there are. Other than that, I remain Jovia Katwaise, your teacher of biology for God and my country. Somera Mudiro Lyo, Nge Wagidua, Maryland High School, Elisangi Wentebe, Somero Lyo Wala Nabalenzi, Tuso Mesa Arts and Sciences, Okuvile Dela Kusini Yesoka, Okutukile Dela Kusini Yomukaga, Ngali Sangi Wamu Chifechi Wewe Pogurunje, Tuline Bisule Yomulembe, Science Laboratory, Sakoni Computer Lab, Wamune, Boso Mesa Zomwa Na Uma Somero Kajanan Schools, Omuli Kambasi Yepombo Kalure, Neye Kabala Gala, Chowa Nabwela Likirivubo Nao, Ogo Msinjo Kutambuzibo Vyanjigiriza, Nen Soma Yaba Ize Yomulembe, Muma Somero Gafiga Nogo Nao,